William Osler once said, humanity has three major enemies, fever, famine and war. But by far the greatest and the most terrible of that is fever. Fever uh, is estimated to be about 4 million years old. It's a evolutionary response to an insult. It's also known to occur in other arthropoda, vertebra and annelida. Diseases haven't changed in centuries. It's the understanding of the disease, diagnosis and treatment has changed the last two centuries. Fever, you know, the, as soon as we have fever, it's a knee-jerk response. We want to treat that, we want to reduce the fever. Is that a correct policy? Let's look into it. You have fever? Yeah, you need to take medicine. That is correct when you have a non-infectious cause of fever. When it is infectious, you know, there's a thought that, you know, it's harmful, it's poisonous, it's noxious, it's difficult, you know, it, it becomes, it makes you uncomfortable, a child becomes restless. Yeah, all that is possible, it is understood. When the fever crosses 141.5 centigrade or 106 to 108, that's called as hyperpyrexia. Then there's a possibility of definite cell injury, uh, local effects and the system effects. It also is a load on your uh, entire body. It can increase your heart rate, increase your respiratory rate. It's a load on your kidneys, it's a load on your heart. How far of that is quantified? It's a little difficult. The only clinical condition where there is abundant evidence to suppress fever is an acute brain injury, whatever the cause, whether it is hemorrhage, infection or hypoxia, whatever the cause of brain injury is, if you reduce the fever, there is a definite beneficial effect on the brain. There are few ways by which fever is likely to benefit you. First thing, it checks the growth of bacteria. High fever or fever can kill the bacteria directly. Third, antimicrobials or the antibiotics work better when you have fever. It's amusing that the first evidence of uh, fever benefiting was demonstrated in a cold-blooded animal like iguana. Those iguanas who were injected with the bacteria, the ones who mounted, who were kept at a higher temperature, those ones who had fever, even with anti-fever medicines, are the ones who survived. Those iguanas who were kept in a colder temperature were the ones who died. A similar experiment was conducted in sheep and mice. They also had a similar response where the ones who had fever and those who mounted a strong fever response are the ones who survived. Even among humans, those ones who have higher temperature are the ones who are likely to survive and do better. Among elderly people who have community acquired pneumonia, those in those elderly people who have fever and leukocytosis are the ones who tend to do better than who do not have fever or uh, leukocytosis. There was a study published in American Society for Microbiology where they demonstrated when they incubated bacteria at 45 degrees centigrade, uh, the bacteria tend to grow lesser with antimicrobials. A similar study was conducted where they demonstrated the, uh, the bacterial growth at varying temperatures starting from 38 to 41 and 0.5 degree centigrade. They showed the increased efficacy of antimicrobials with a range of almost 4 to 16 times higher uh, than those ones who are incubated at a lesser temperature. Another randomized controlled study was done among critically ill patients in ICU without brain injury. They did not show any significant difference in terms of survival uh, or long-term follow-up uh, when treated for fever and those ones treated without for fever. 
but of course other supportive treatment and antibiotics were continued. Even in the management of febrile seizure, treating a child uh, with prophylactically for fever has not proven to prevent the recurrences of febrile seizures. With this, we come to the question, is fever good or bad? You know, uh, fever is probably an evolutionary response to an insult. Blunting that evolutionary response may be maladaptive. Uh, going by the, uh, the benefits and the side effects, the pendulum is swinging more towards the permissive uh, fever. You know, you let the fever be there in a person, whether it is in a child or an adult, in a, within an acceptable range. That makes us ask a few questions. What is the maximum height of temperature at which you can allow? Second, can it be individualized? That means, is there a difference between an adult and a child? Is there a difference between a man and a woman? Is there any racial differences? Is there any genetic marker which says, okay, this is the height of temperature at which you can allow this person to be? And the other important question what we need to answer is, what happens when you have other comorbid conditions? When you have a heart disease or a lung disease or a kidney disease or you have any other element what's the permissive height of temperature a lot more studies have to be done to make this complicated issue far simpler at this point i would sign off saying a little temperature in otherwise normal individual or in a growing child who doesn't seem to have any other comorbid condition a little fever should be accepted is what my opinion is well thanks for tuning in like subscribe share it among your friends and then let the knowledge spread not individual perspectives a lot of knowledge has to be spread across the community to get the better out of it thanks again